Hey everyone, it's Mr. Frazier. Before we begin, I want to just remind you that these videos are unscripted, and as such, you're going to hear me sounding silly and ridiculous, and that's kind of the fun of it. Um, remember to take your notes and to follow along. This video is the second video in our short look at the histories of South America. For this video, we're going to look at the similar histories within the Pampas and Andes region. The Pampas and Andes region, for your clarification, is this region here, so pretty much all of southern and western South America. Uh, as we look at these histories, we're going to see uh, specific trends like immigration, um, industrialization, and the like. So please pay attention. If I write something down, remember it's probably significant enough for you to write down. Here we go. When we look at the Pampas and Andes region, after independence, the Criollos, who were at the top of Spanish South America, uh, rose up and established an oligarchy. An oligarchy is when a small group of people holds all the power, so sp specific families or specific um, regions. And so this small group of people held all the power, and at the head of these small groups of people were strong men who took control of the government. So these are, these are um, charismatic individuals within these, these, these groups. Um, and in this region, the Pampas and the Andes, um, we have a situation where racial identity becomes incredibly important. Basically, if you're not a Creole, uh, Creole um, you have little chance for political or economic well-being. Um, so if you are not European, you are not allowed to vote or participate in many um, economic endeavors. Uh, you're, you're very much held down. And we'll see that first with Manuel de Rojas, who was an Argentinian early in Argentina's history. Um, what he actually did is um, he took the Native Americans who had basically had control of all this land here, and he pushed them west into Chile and into southern Chile and into Brazil. And as he, with his army and forces, pushed Native American troops, uh, not troops, Native American um, civilization out of Argentina, he quickly replaced that land with a cattle industry, um, which is beef, um, to, uh, you know, cows. Um, and this ranching industry becomes the primary um, business of Argentina. Um, even today, Argentina is known for their beef and their leather, both of which obviously come from cow. So Rojas' contribution to Argentina is basically he made the country European. Um, today, if we visit your, um, Argentina, you'll notice very few to no Native American history within it um, or examples of people from the, um, from the Americas. Um, you'll notice a Europe, very European country, European-looking people, and that's because Rojas basically kicked them out. Um, Let's talk about the the region as a whole known as the Southern Cone, okay? And we'll also talk a little bit about Peru on this slide. So the Southern Cone, uh, cone really comes into its own in the 1870s, about 60 years after independence. Um, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Chile are the Southern Cone. What they did is they developed a food and uh, a food export business to Europe and the United States. Now, the reason they did this is populations in cities grew around the world as industrialization, industrialization took hold. Remember, if I'm writing it down, it's probably important enough for you to write it down. So the population of cities grew around the world in the 1870s as industrialization took hold. And basically, as people left farms around the world and began to move to cities, they needed food to, to feed them because people were leaving the farms. And so they began to sell food to Europe and the United States. Um, additionally, immigrants came from the southern cone, as came to the southern cone from places like Italy and Spain for two reasons. First, um, 
Argentina, and to a large extent Chile, were European countries. There was very few Native Americans or African um, Americans in the country, so it was a very European-like place. Um, and then secondly, um, the there was work opportunities in the Southern Cone. Let's talk about Peru for a moment. Um, in Peru, sugar plantations and mines brought immigrants from China and Japan. So basically, in China and Japan, where there was a um, history of silver mining, um, the end of colonialism allowed for Chinese and Japanese people to be incentivized enough to come to um, Peru to work in mines and on sugar plantations. Um, the result of which is, if you visit this region here, okay, the mountainous regions of Peru, Bolivia, you're going to find many Chinese uh, and Japanese immigrants. And if you visit, you know, Boston, you go to Chinatown, you can imagine um, Peru, many Peruvian cities actually have Chinatowns. And, and uh, if you visit... Uh, Argentina and Chile, you're going to hear many people who are of Italian descent and Spanish descent um, within those populations. So I'll write that there to help. Alright. Um, so let's take a look. Italians and Spanish, Chinese and Japanese. In the early 1900s though, Okay, agricultural, as, as agriculture became more successful in the United States with the rise of railroads connecting both coasts to the center part of the Great Plains of the United States, um, the need for food around the world dropped because the United States was outproducing um, South America. Um, so in the early 1900s, uh, the exports dropped and the economy suffered. So the government encouraged industrialization. Basically, they were turning to factories um, and mass production of products, similar to what was successful earlier in the United States. Um, with the drop of farming and the increase of factories, people moved to the cities to work in these factories. As they moved into the cities, many of these people were poor, and were frustrated with their condition, and they became a political force. Um, and they be began to elect into power um, those individuals who promised the most to the poor. And these people promised to make sweeping, big, large changes by acting as dictators. Um, and so Juan Perón in Argentina in the 1930s promised social justice and economic independence. Now, Juan Perón is a very controversial figure, um, but in essence, he became dictator and promised social justice and economic independence. He did this through strong arming, taking away from business, and he was you know, kind of controversial. Uh, Salvador Allende of Chile in the 1970s told poor workers um, that he would create um, social change, and both of these men, in Argentina in the 1930s, and Chile in the 1970s, nationalized industry. Basically, they took control of factories. Um, I'm going to change this to say factories. I hope you do too. So, as they took control of factories, okay, they promised to give back land and wealth to the poor. This caused a fear to that they would be moving towards communist policy, policies, a fear that was um, made uh, and believed by many people of wealth, in particular the Euro those of European descent. Uh, and so revolution against these dictators and violence against these dictators rose in Argentina earlier in the century and later Chile. And so there's a history of revolution and violence here because of fear that by taking away um, private business and nationalizing it that they're becoming communists. And so what happens is as these groups are rebelling and violence ensues, the military actually begins to take control um, of the government. And the military, in order to maintain control, ends free speech. So they control the news. Um, 
news, communication, the outlaw protest, Um, and basically, they stomp out opposition, so they quiet the workers and the poor. Um, those people who were a political force, who had some weight, some power because of their voting, um, became victims, basically. And the military control in Argentina and Chile ended with the murder of tens of thousands of people, the arrest of tens of thousands, and a series of secret prisons and torture centers. It was a very dark time in the histories of Chile and Argentina. Um, and again, this is in response to a fear that by taking and nationalizing industry, they were moving towards communism, a system, as you found out from your candy activity, that may not be popular with most people. In response to this, in the 1980s, democracy began to return in some form to the region. Okay, so people began in the 1980s to vote. Um, it's been a slow recovery since, okay? The violence has ended, and people vote for political change. But there is still the struggle. between rich and poor. Okay? So, when we look, if we're going to recap the history of the Papas in the Andes, um, it's a region which um, was largely con controlled by those of European ancestry, um, specifically under Rosas in Argentina. There's a history of kicking out and marginalizing Native American groups and African American groups. Um, also, uh, because of opportunities for mining and agriculture early in the, I'm sorry, late in the 1800s, there was a wave of immigration from both China, uh, Japan, and in southern part, um, Spain and Italy. Um, because of a need for industrialization to save their economies, the, there was a growth in the cities, but also a growth in the city poor, um, who gave power to dictators, um, who promised to nationalize industry as a respo response to the nationalization of industry. Um, the the um, military took, took control out of fear, um, and there was a series of uh, a, a long stretch of violence between the 1960s and uh, all the way until the in the 1980s, and then in the 1980s, democracy returned and slowly to the region. Violence has ended, but there's still a struggle between rich and poor. So I hope that you have been taking good notes. I know we've been moving fast, but remember, at any point, you could rewind. Um, make sure if you have any questions, you ask me in class, or you can shoot me an email. Um, keep going with these modules. Good luck, um, and we'll talk to you soon.